to Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Welcome to all visitors who have joined us this morning and all visitors online who are watching. I'm so happy that you have found us. If you are online, you can go to the live worship page on our website and find the worship folder, and you can follow along with the, for the, with the worship service and the Bible class after. The Bible class slides are also included there as well. It is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord, but really it's U-Turn Sunday. This is when we talk about going one direction and then turning all the way around and going the other direction. This, we're going to talk about conversion as we jump into Romans chapter 10. What is the logistics of how God takes a heart that hates him and turns it into one that is devoted to him completely? It's amazing to see what our God does. God the Holy Spirit is pretty awesome in that regard. But we begin our worship with our first hymn, hymn 570, O Christians Hate. And of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turning points. Those powerful, life-changing experiences bring the events of our past and the direction of our future into much clearer focus. Through these amazing experiences, our sinful past is revealed, and our future of following Christ is plotted out. At the sight of holy angels surrounding the lofty throne of the radiant Lord, Isaiah cries out in shame over his past. Woe to me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. But this glorious vision of the enthroned God and God's removal of sin motivate him to commit his life to serving God. Here I am, send me. When Christ tells Peter to let down his nets, and when an abundance of fish nearly breaks the nets and almost all sinks two boats. Peter falls on his knees, overwhelmed with guilt over his past. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But this miraculous sign and Christ's removal of fear motivate Peter to bring his boat to shore and obey the words of Christ. 
from now on, you will be catching people. At the turning point of our own lives, we follow the footsteps of Isaiah and Peter, turning away from our past and denouncing the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. And at the turning points of our own lives, we strive to reach the goals God set for us, turning toward the future and commending our lives, our actions, and our destiny to building up the church. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Most merciful God, troubled and penitent, we confess our sins to You. Our deeds are evil. We have loved darkness rather than the light. We languish in the shadow of death. Let Your mercy dawn upon us for the sake of Jesus Christ, Your Son, who was anointed by the Spirit to proclaim Your favor. Within our hearts and in our lives, let there be light. God, who once commanded light to shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. For His sake, your sins are forgiven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, walk as children of light. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, we praise our God. At this time, I invite the children of the congregation to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, ladies. It is great to have you here with us. How many of you have ever played a sport before? Basketball, baseball, maybe soccer? Nice. Okay, we got one taken. Okay. Well, Pastor Fred liked to play soccer, but I wasn't very good. So in college, I had on a white jersey, it wasn't, this is a preaching robe, but I had a white jersey on, and it was a rainy day in New Ulm, Minnesota, and my team won, I think, but it was so muddy that by the end of the game, all of the players were covered in mud from head to toe, except for me. I think there were two other kids who didn't play at all, either. But you don't want to walk back from the field to the dorm looking all perfectly white, when the rest of the team is scattered in mud, right? So how do you think I fixed that? I found the nearest mud puddle and I jumped right into it head first. And I got covered in mud. So that way I could walk back to campus and everyone wouldn't think, oh, that guy didn't even walk on the court at all or, or the field. Well, the problem was I got a sinus infection because I got mud up my nose. Would not advise jumping in a mud puddle, ladies. That's a bad idea. But... 
How did I get clean after that? How did I clean my jersey? How did I get the mud off my body, out of my hair? Yes. I took a shower. Excellent answer. That's right. That's how I got all of the dirt off of me. And I don't, I didn't, we didn't clean our own jerseys. Someone else did that for us. That was very nice of them. But it came back clean. It was white after that. Well, so you guys know how to clean something on the outside. But how do you clean something on the inside? How do we make ourselves clean after we've done something that we don't feel good about? And yes, sometimes we even feel dirty. How can we take a shower on the inside? Well, we can't. That's where we need God's help. And in this first lesson, you're going to hear the prophet Isaiah talk about how God made him clean. There's a picture of an angel taking a hot coal and touching his lips, and now all of his speech was clean. It's just a picture. But the point is, God is the one who cleans us on the inside. And he does that because Jesus died for our sins. And so all the things that maybe you've done this week or in your past or even tomorrow in the future, God forgives you. And you are clean before your God and the rest of the world, too, because of what Jesus has done. Let's fold our hands and say a prayer. Dear Jesus, it's important for us to stay clean. Hygiene is great, whether it be brushing our teeth or taking a shower. We should take care of our bodies. But you also ask us to take care of our souls. And we find care for our souls by going into your word finding out how much you love us and how we are completely clean because Jesus has forgiven us. Help us to do that regularly, Lord. Amen. You're excused to go to your Sunday school class. Our first lesson is taken from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. God called Isaiah to the prophetic office with a grand vision of heaven. This man of unclean lips was called to carry the message of salvation for the Lord. Though sin had separated him from the Lord Almighty, yet the Lord of free and faithful grace took away his guilt and atoned for his sin. With a pure and contrite heart, Isaiah boldly answered the Lord's call. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, 
the first 11 verses. In calling the disciples to be full-time fishers of men, Jesus reveals his power as the Lord's anointed. What a beautiful picture of future fishing for these mature disciples. For the miracle of this abundant catch of fish would only be surpassed by the fishing for souls to which they were called. What a privilege for us to answer the same call, to lay our hands in the net of the gospel and be fishers of men. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the, one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he, then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, you sent your one and only Son as the word of life for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us to believe what the scriptures proclaim about him and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our hymn of the day, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, hymn 93.
mercy and peace are yours in abundance. From God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. Chapter 10, verses 13 through 17. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. So far, our text. Dear Christian friends, if you've ever taught a child how to drive, um, sometimes they get lost. And sometimes they get turned around and you have to tell them, if you miss your exit on the freeway, don't try to yeet it and just get over three lanes to get off. Just go down to the next exit. Yes, it'll take you five or ten minutes. But you know what? No one got into a car accident. You have more time than money. Turning around completely after you're going the wrong direction, well, it's humbling. It can be time-consuming. And yet it is of eternal importance if it involves your spiritual life. If you don't know who Jesus is, it's really important, especially if you're watching my words online and you don't have a talk to me, and you will have a chance to talk with me. You can email me, write me, and you don't necessarily need me to bring you to Jesus. The Bible can do that all on its own. It is his word. Well, on that point, I want to start with the last verse first. In fact, all the verses previous to this are just a commentary leading up to verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard through the word of Christ. Today we're going to spend some time talking about where faith does not come from, and then going into, into detail exactly how that happens. The logistics of how a stony, dead heart comes to life and believes in Jesus. Well, <clears throat> Let's talk about effort. I don't know how many of you have ever done tug of war, anything that involves extreme effort. Sometimes if you push really, really hard, you can even black out a little bit if you push too hard and you strain yourself. Well, there are some people who treat their faith in a very similar way. I want to go before our text. This is all the way back up to verse 8 of chapter 10 of, of Romans. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's near you. How is it near me? Well, how hard is it to find a Bible? In 2022, my word, you can go online and there's a Bible right there. It's free. And I think the Bible is still one of the best-selling books ever, every year. Because for whatever reason, people want to hear God's word. And it's always curious to me how people just, you know, we'll just look in there and see what it is. And if you ask me for a Bible from our church, guess what I'd tell you? Yeah, take one. We'll happily buy more. That's what we do as a church, is give out God's word for free to anyone who wants it. That's fantastic. Well, you don't need to climb a mountain. You don't need to go down to the depths of the sea. But I want to give you a different picture of how you do not find God. This lady is called Giselle Allen. <coughs> and she has a storied criminal history. She was on trial recently for shooting a gun through a car and the shrapnel struck a toddler. She's kind of a winner. But it's interesting what Google does for you. If you go back 10 years earlier, she was in a low-speed chase. Now, if you said that sounds weird, well, it kind of is. She was going 78 in a 55. That's a little fast, 20 over. And she had, you know, she was about to get pulled over. But instead of pulling over, she goes down to the speed limit and starts driving to her home. She even stops at stoplights, but she does not pull over no matter how many cars behind her have their lights on, flashing, and sirens blaring. She just kept on going. 
<laughs> until the cops figured out that we need to put down some tire strips, the nails that stick up if you go into one of those very dangerous parking ramps and you go the wrong way. It's another student driver thing they teach them. And they blew out her tires, and they finally pulled her over to a stop, and they asked her, why? We did you not? Why did you not stop? And then she started to resist arrest, so they had to tase her. Come to find out, she thought that if she just followed the rules after she broke the rules, they'd leave her alone. Well, that's not how it works. I'm telling you, young drivers, if a cop ever wants to pull you over, pull over. Because you cannot outrun a radio. They will get help. Giselle found that out the hard way. And I, I, I just kind of love the example. Because do you think that people look at God and they say, well, yes, I did something wrong once, but I'm really trying really hard. I'm trying really hard. God's got to love me. He's got to bring me into his kingdom. He's got to make me one of his children and listen to my prayer. And yes, even he has to take me home to glory. On my deathbed, I will tell people, I tried really hard. And I would say, well, that's not good enough. Because that's what your God says. No amount of effort or trying can get you into the kingdom of heaven. And the poster child for this is a guy from Mark chapter 9. He's a dad. And i got to tell you, as a dad, I can kind of feel for the guy. This is starting with verse 22. Um, he had, he had a, a sick child. The child didn't have leukemia. He had a demon. He said, it had often thrown him into fire or water or tried to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the, father's, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, that sounds backwards, doesn't it? What is he even trying to say? If you have a sick child and you're watching them suffer, you would happily take on the disease, the illness, the demon. Do you care? It's your child. You would do anything. And it's hard to explain until you have a child. But you totally would. And so, Jesus says, believe, and all you have to do for your child to get better is just believe in Jesus, and he can, because it doesn't depend on effort. Faith does not come by effort, and that's so disappointing, isn't it? Well, that's what we want to do, but we can't. No amount of prayer, and I, I, I have to kind of talk to people about prayer. Prayer is fantastic. Prayer is called the Christian's vital breath. But prayer is one-way communication. Prayer is how you talk to God. And there's a woman who came into my office. This is early in my ministry. I've been doing this for 19 years. And she said that she saw a billboard that said, Jesus saves. And so she prayed, Jesus, I, I just want to, but that's all she knew. She said it wasn't working. I said, okay, well, what do you know about Jesus? That he's on a billboard and that he saves. That's it. What else is there? Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> and so God throws you this nice softball pitch, and then you wind up and you whack out of the park and you tell this woman everything about Jesus. A nice organized long gospel presentation because I went to the seminary and I have a degree in theology. But all of you are capable of doing that. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But that's the joy. But the point is, you just sitting there willing and even praying to something that you don't know isn't possible so i direct you back to verse 17 because we can't read it enough today consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of christ it's so beautiful and it's so simple so let's talk about this a little bit more this is verse 13 for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved so you tell someone who Jesus is and all that they've done for them. And then they confess their faith and they believe in him. They call on his name. They will be saved. There's no doubt. But now you have this rhetorical question thread from the Apostle Paul. This is verse 14. Here we go. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? 
Well, they can't. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? They can't. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? They can't. And how can they preach unless they are sent? They can't do that either. As it is written, how beautiful are the, are the feet of those who bring good news. That's where you have the call of Isaiah. That's where you have the fishers of men. You send people, someone, missionaries. When I was growing up, we had Sunday school money. We, have all, we, we support our synod by our congregational mission offering. We do this. Every church, the 1,200 churches in our church body do this because we support world mission. We send people across the country because I can't go there. I live here. That's okay. That's what we do. We pull our resources to create seminaries and colleges. And that's why we have a church body, a synod, that we walk together with other, other Christians to do something bigger. It's fantastic. But now, how could your feet be beautiful, even if they're kind of ugly? They could be beautiful because you, now that, I don't know if you saw I was going to go there. You might be the one to tell them. And if that's crippling and terrifying, then just, just relax. Coming up on Friday, we have a Valentine's Parents' Night Out. This is one of at least, I don't know, I think it's like 18 events we have. No, I think it's 22. 22 events planned this year that our church does outreach for. And we've gotten more and more organized as the years have gone by, and the church helps me more because if I'm doing it all, it doesn't go very well. So you guys help me a lot. But I'm kind of excited because the ads on Facebook started for Valentine's Parents' Night Out, but that's not where it stopped. There's something called organic marketing where your feet become extremely beautiful when you find the event on Facebook and you click share. And when you do, all of your 500, 300, 100 friends see that on their feed. That's called organic marketing. And just like that, you haven't said a word, and yet you've witnessed your faith, you've pointed them to Jesus, and you might be helping a marriage too. Because when they drop off their kids, they're going to get a little resource for the five love languages. For them to take away something they maybe never heard before. And that they could help their marriage. That's just one example of how we reach out to the community. And you can help with the event too if you want. I'm excited about this. As all of the outreach events, they're all a little bit different. But it's really cool to think that God might use you to accomplish his outreach. And that's just one example. Let me take you back to verse 8. And we're going to get to that guy. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That, do you know what that little box on his head is called? That is a phylactery. Yes, it's a fancy word. The Jews would put a, they'd write down a piece of scripture, and they'd put it in a box and put it on their head. Because God does say in the Old Testament that you should take his word and bind it on your door frames, and I don't remember the exact passage, but he did command this. Mezuzahs, I don't have a picture of a mezuzah, but on a Jewish house, they actually have it on their gate. It's a piece of scripture. Normally it's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, I, I, that's not wrong to put, to write down a Bible passage, put it in a box, and then tie it to your head. Meh. I don't know that that's the best way to go. That's not wrong. I think it's important to memorize scripture. I think that that's helpful too. So it's right there. Some people have said the only Bible you really have with you is the one in your heart, the one in your head. So you can kind of quote scripture back. It doesn't have to be perfect. Find the, the NIV, the King James, I don't really care. It's all God's word. Because if faith comes from hearing the message, do you have to get John 3.16 perfectly or can you just communicate God really loves you, and he died for you. And because of that, you're forgiven. That's not a direct quote from anywhere in Scripture, but that's the gospel. That is God's word, and it's beautiful. So, let's go down there. We've talked about how it doesn't, how, how the Scripture does not, faith does not come by effort. No matter how hard you strain or pull or push or pray, it does not come by that. But we need to be cautious because it doesn't come by our effort either. I already talked about Valentine's Parents' Night Out. But how exactly does it 
come. And this is where we're going to talk about the decision for Christ. How many of you live in the Bible Belt? All of you should raise your hands. Don't, you don't have to. Yeah. You live in the Bible Belt. You're surrounded by wonderful Reformed Christians who are, in general, wonderful people. But the theology talks about a decision that they have to make for Jesus. That's an important step. I'd say about half of Christendom goes with that if you divide it into that Reformed and the Unreformed camp. But that's beside the point. Let's talk about it a little bit. So, let's, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's fantastic. You share the gospel. I've given you a couple different renditions of it. And you share it with somebody and they listen to you. What might they do? They might say, yes, well, let me back up a little bit just to be clear. So you share the gospel with them, and then you ask them a question. Do you believe that Jesus is your Savior who died for your sins? They can say, yes. They can say, no. They can say, I don't know, maybe. I'm not sure. It's kind of confusing. All of those are legitimate, fantastic answers. Now, the reason why you do this is you go to verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. That's not saying that what is in your heart and what crosses your lips are different. That's saying that they're connected. So often, if I want to know if someone's a Viking fan, I ask them what they think about the Minnesota Vikings. And they tell me. And often I don't like their answer. But that's okay, because football affiliation is meaningless. Could someone said, Pastor, could someone be lying to you if you asked them, what do you, what do you think about Jesus? I said, well, they could be, but they can't lie to God. I mean, he would know that, right? So I don't worry about it. God has not called me to be a private investigator. I don't follow my members around to see if they're actually living and confessing their faith. That's not my job. As a shepherd of souls, if there's something obvious, I'll offer a gentle rebuke and I'll try to correct and encourage and point them back to their scripture and their God who loves them so much. That's my job. But so let's go back there. You have just shared the gospel. You have told them exactly who Jesus is and you have this promise. This is verse 11. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It's a pretty powerful word, isn't it? So they respond, yes, you rejoice. And let's just back it up. Let's say you're surrounded by Baptists and you share your faith at a McDonald's. And they say, yes, I believe that. Give them a hug and tell them to keep going to their church. That's awesome. You can never have too many friends, especially ones who are Christians. They say no. Ask if you can talk to them further. If they don't want to, that's okay. You've just witnessed your faith and you've glorified your God in the process. Because after all, that is the purpose of evangelism. It's not to put butts in the pews. That's a goal far too lofty. Your goal is just to share Jesus. That's it. And if they say, I don't know, that third answer, we'll take some time. Offer them again. Well, let's talk about it more. Have a great day. Just give it time. God promised to work, but he didn't promise to work in 30 seconds. Just give it time. And I know that a lot of you have family or friends that you've been talking to, witnessing to for years. Don't give up. You can pray for them, absolutely. Ask that God would bless your efforts. And he will. Now, that's where I want to caution you because when you share Jesus, remember that he died for you too. Because Faith does not come by your effort. As if we just tried hard enough for Valentine's parents that out, then people would come to know him. It's possible no one will show up. And that's okay, because we have just told as many people in the community as possible that we exist, and we tried. <laughs> that's okay, too. And in my experience, people see that. And they'll come five months from now and say, well, your church seems like they're trying anyway. So I just wanted to check it out. And that's good. But let's say that you have a softball and you didn't hit out of the park. Someone came to you and said, tell me more about Jesus. And you said, I'm too busy. Or something along those lines. 
And then the next day you realize that you didn't do a good job and you feel terrible. Know that your God cleans you on the inside. And know that you are forgiven. And know that as a pastor, it is crushing to think of all the times when I failed to share Jesus. And that God still has a place for me in his kingdom. And he picks me up, dusts me off, and says, try again tomorrow. Try again next Sunday. Because I'm not done with you yet. Christian, he's not done with you. He forgives you and loves you, and you are his messenger. And that's beautiful. And so, faith does not come by effort. It doesn't come by prayer. Not by the effort of the person trying to hear it. Not by your effort. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now praise our God with our next hymn, 293, God's Word is Our Great Heritage. Please stand for prayer. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. Shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth and move us to be your heralds of salvation to, to the community that lives around us. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our five petitions. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory with all your saints and angels 
singing the everlasting song of triumph. We join in the prayer that you taught us, Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our worship with our final hymn, verses 1 and 4 of hymn 573, Hark the Voice of Jesus Christ. Welcome again to all of you and to all visitors who have joined us this morning. Welcome to those of you online who have visited with us. If you could just leave a comment on YouTube or Facebook in the chat box. If you're able, I know a lot of you watch on your TVs or you don't have an account. That's great. I still love it that you have found us. Just who you are and where you are is plenty. Fred from Winston watching today. And uh, that is all that we would need. There is a link. I'm going to walk back to the sound desk and tweak something. There is a link in your service folder online for the Valentine's Parents Night Out that will take you to the event on the website. And at the bottom where it says event on social media, that is a link to Facebook as well. At this time, we are going to jump into our Bible class. And I think that was probably a bad spot. Songs of Praise, Worship Windows. There's been quite a hiatus. It's been three weeks. We lost two Sundays due to snow, and then we had a congregation meeting last Sunday. But we are back into our after-worship Bible class and the song of praise. We're going through the Western Rite, and it's kind of like a Bible information class using the Western Rite, which is fun for me. Any different way you can hack up God's Word and present it is kind of creative and fun. But let's look at the song of praise. The Gloria in Excelsis is the fancy Latin phrase for it. But number one, Worship is completely one-sided communication from us to God. No, that's false. We always want to praise God. I, I mean, I could say, should you always want to praise God? Yes, yes. But the reality is, not always. Ever had a bad day? Yeah. Three, all churches follow a church year. Not really. I mean, if you celebrate Christmas and Easter, technically you are, but um, not really. Um, four, Mother's Day is a minor festival of the church year. No. How about Valentine's Day? No. Those are Hallmark holidays. They're good. I like Mother's Day. It's great. But yeah. Five, traditional. Tradition is a great reason for why we do. It's not a bad, like, so if you see something, 
made the example of a tradition. If you walk across the field and you see a fence, and you don't know why it's there, should you pull up the fence? Eh, probably not. Somebody put it there for a reason, right? But you, it might be good to know why the fence is there, right? It's to keep out the wolves, or it's to divide up the pasture, or who knows. But yeah, there's, there's probably a reason why the tradition exists, but it's worth our time studying that. So, well, let's look at the song of praise. The glory to Excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest, is Latin for glory to God in the highest. It can be traced back to the 4th century to Hilary of Poitiers. It's not a song that simply praises God for who he is, but it chiefly praises God for what he has done. Luther's quoted on the glorious saying, it, it did not grow nor was it made, but it came from heaven. And he said that because, it's a quote from Luke 2. You have the angels singing this song of praise. That's why we sing it in the song of praise. All right, next. How many of you have ever sung the Gloria? Even if you don't think you have, you have. Yeah. This beautiful, that chunk of Luke 2 works its way into a lot of songs. And we have taken some of the historic songs of the liturgy and replaced them with other hymns. Sometimes we sneak them in. We have a new hymnal. And there's been a little bit of delay because we don't have all the resources for it, like the accompaniment book for the hymns that's supposed to come out mid-February. So <laughs> it's coming, I promise. We have purchased the books. They're just not all here yet. But yeah, so kind of it'll be interesting to see a different setting and a different arrangement of that. So here you have it. This is the divine service. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. You've heard me say that. And then this is one version of it. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly king, almighty God and father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only son of the father, Lord God, lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the father. Receive our prayer. Receive our prayer. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in the glory of the Father. That is a popular song. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God, glory to God. Now, you have the actual verse why Luther said it was from heaven. This is Luke 2. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Why is right after the absolution where we say that you're forgiven a great place to put the Gloria? So what do you want to do? Praise him. Yeah. You're going to see the Super Bowl here in a week, and afterwards... They always find some guy who just won the Super Bowl, and they said, I don't, I'm not going to say who I think is going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> Whoever just won the Super Bowl, you just won the Super Bowl, what are you going to do? Go to Disney World, yeah. I'm going to praise God, yeah, yeah, they don't, but John! Yes, yes, John. Yeah. John, so the, the, the Gloria says, peace and on earth, peace, peace, good, goodwill, on whom his favor rests. His point is that um, the reason why we have peace is because God gave it to us, and that's why we, we praise our God. So, yeah, there's a direct correlation is your point. Yeah, that's good. All right, number three, this is Job 3. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest but only turmoil. I don't know how well you know the book of Job, but um, do you always feel like praising God? <laughs> Not always, no. It's interesting. Um, I don't, we don't do a whole lot of Bible or history on the hymns themselves, but like, now thank we all our God. Some of those hymns, I mean, now thank we all our God was right after a whole bunch of people had died in the congregation. And the pastor wrote this hymn for that service. Now we use it on Thanksgiving, you know, our Thanksgiving worship. But yeah, it's, it's powerful when you see some of the history behind some of these hymns and why they were written and stuff. It's kind of cool. So 
The answer is no, and don't think you're a terrible person. It's because you are clothed in sinful flesh, you live in a sinful world, and the, and the devil hates you. That's why you don't always feel like praising God. And that's why it's always good to reorient yourself to God's word and to hear that reminder of his love and his providence over your life. But you're not alone. Everyone has a bad day. And don't get crushed. And one of my least favorite phrases, if, if you're a good Christian or a bad Christian, what does that even mean? You've had a bad day because all of your kids just died and your wife hates you. You've had a bad day. And he lost his business. So I get it. That's a confession. It's raw. That's how you feel some days. What is a church year? An annual schedule of worship that follows the life of Christ. That's it. And so what we do is Advent, we start, and I think you get a picture, yep. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, and then um, you get the Sundays after Pentecost. It's called ordinary time, some circles. Advent is Jesus' is coming, Christmas he came, Epiphany, miracles, he reveals himself to the world. Lent, he's dying for your sins, his passion. Good Friday, he's dead. Easter, he lives. Easter season, is more evangelical, he's alive, he's risen, he appeared for 40 days. Pentecost was the great harvest festival, the harvest of souls then. And then you have the long green season where you have sermon series on everything. It's summer. Yeah, we talk about your life in Christ, which is your job, Christian. Live it. So, and then we sneak in end times just before Advent because I like talking about the end of the world. And then we do it all over again. I think it's a great way to go through your, your, your worship life. Now, you don't have to. You could just take different chunks of Scripture and preach on them. But most people celebrate Christmas at Christmas. And most people celebrate Easter at Easter, even the ones who don't do anything else the rest of the year. So, yeah, that's why we follow a church year. Because I think it's good. All right, if the major festivals of the church year are Christmas and Easter, what are examples of a minor festival? Ascension is a major one. Yeah, it's tough, though, because it always falls on a Thursday. What's that? Baptism of the Lord always falls on a Sunday. So technically, every Sunday is a major festival. Some are a little bit bigger than others. But any, yeah, anything that follows um, the life of... So the, um, the uh, St. Uh, Michael and All Angels Sunday, or um, they call it Michaelmas. Um, there's, man, there's like 50 of them. Like, basically every apostle has their own little Sunday, and you talk about his life. If it falls on a Sunday, maybe I'll preach on it. Yeah, sorry, Evelyn. Same thing, in e e Epiphany is, is a major festival as well, but again, it's, I don't know if it's always a Thursday, but it's 12 days after Christmas. And so, yeah, normally we, we, we hit it on a Sunday. In fact, if you're keeping score at home, we're actually off one Sunday of the church year. And if you're really, really keeping score at home, technically this was the, um, these were the lessons for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. And I, I switched the Sundays because I can do whatever I want because next Sunday's talking about love and I wanted to line it up for the Hallmark holiday of Valentine's Day. But I, none of you said, Pastor, did you switch the fifth and the fourth Sunday? What did you do? Yeah, so anyway. Y'all are aware of my, yeah. I can't wait to hear the Mother's Day sermon on Sunday. Mother's Day isn't a church festival. <laughs> that is a meme. Yes, but guess what I'll be preaching on on Mother's Day. I, I, I always, there's a certain amount of being aware of your surroundings. I'm going to talk about Mother's Day at least a little bit. Throw in a paragraph about moms. If you don't, that's being culturally tone deaf. You have to, like I had a professor who said, have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. So you, that you can be relative and preach to people. People live in the world. So you might as well talk to them about it. So. Is tradition a great reason for why we worship the way we do? Yeah, it doesn't really matter, is Tom's point. It's not bad. And I would say there are a lot of fences around us. Should we just rip them up and throw them away? Maybe look at them first, right? And say, if it doesn't work for us, we're not going to do that. But I don't know that we just rip up fences willy-nilly and get rid of them. So I think traditions are normally there for a good reason. But 
fold it, I think I need something more than because it's traditional. You just run off the cliff if you're, the, if you're that lemming. So I think it is worth studying because if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, well, we could talk about it. So I think it's this ongoing education of Christianity. Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. What is the best kind of art to worship God? Psalms are good. What about stained glass? Well, and I, I, I'd say any art that communicates the message of the gospel. So if you look at the stained glass above, behind me, and I don't know if there, you can actually see it. You got the butterfly, the candles, the nails, and the cradle. Uh, those are all seasons of, of, of the church here. And so the, there's usually some purpose behind art in a church, which is why I'm hesitant to say one is more beautiful. I, I like music, obviously, um, because we could sing to it, and all the songs are art, and they communicate truths of Scripture. But I, I don't know, if somebody wants to make a painting of something that's, that was in Scripture, that's fantastic too. Here's an example of stained glass somewhere else. Any questions on the Gloria art? We're going to be hitting traditions this whole Bible class of what we do. Hearing nuns, please say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, open our lips to sing your praise. Make our every thought, word, and deed a worship fit for Jesus our King. There are no other announcements. May God give you all a blessed week.